Are you ready to start? Okay. Is that too loud or is it okay the way I'm speaking? Okay. Hello again. How are you all? Finances. Ray, can you talk today? Yes. Ray, can you do the first question, please? It says, I don't have any cash just now. I've got to choose one of these. Flat broken, no money, flat broke or less broken. Which one fits in here? The answer is A. Oh, uh, C. Flat broke. All right. If you're flat broke, it means you've got no money. So. Um, Lulu told me you're rich. Is that true? Ray? Lulu told me you're rich. Is that true? Uh, sorry. That's okay. Are you rich? Oh. No. Do you have enough money? Um, not. <laughs> okay. So you're not quite. You're right. You're not quite flat broke, but you're poor. Okay. Fair enough. What's poverty? What is poverty? Poverty means no money, but not just no money, no money, no house, very poor living conditions. So even if you're flat broke, you probably still live in a house and have a bed rate, which is more than some people. Okay, thank you. Alan, how are you? Hello. Hello. Anna, can you do the next one, please? She needs to ask her parents to lend her some money because she'll be already £250, something at the bank. Overdraw, over debt, over debts are overdrawn. Do you know which one it is? Overdraw. Which one? A, B, C or D? A. No. Have another go. You need a past tense. I don't know. D. Nope. No, I say D. No. Oh. D, okay. I believe you. Overdrawn. Okay? So, if you're overdrawn, it means you have... Does it mean you have no money in the bank, or do you owe? 
So if you're overdrawn, do, uh, do you owe money to the bank or not? Alan, if you're overdrawn, do you owe money to the bank? No. Yes. She owes them $250. So if you're overdrawn, it means that your bank account, you, you have no money. You owe money. Okay? So if you're overdrawn, that means you owe money to the bank. Um, so if you're $500, overdrawn you owe the bank five hundred dollars plus interest okay so be aware overdrawn means that you owe you have a debt you owe money okay Leo can you do the next one hello it says her comp hello Leo he says her company didn't make a profit again this year. She's really still disappointed it's not. A which one? Not make money? In the red, in the black, or no make money? It's one of the colours. Uh, B, B. Good. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, in the red means that you, if you like, you're overdrawn. So in other words, she still hasn't got enough money. She still has a debt. Um, Leah, what do you think in the black means? You earn money or make profit. Yeah, you have a profit. So if you're in the black, you're in profit. If you're in the red, you're in debt. Okay? So th those are quite common in, a, in, in the West. We often use these two expressions. I'm in the red, I'm in the black. Particularly in the red. It's more common. We also say in the black. Okay? Mike. Morning. They found a house they really good hello, Michael. They found a house they really want to buy. Now they want to get us something from the bank. Now mortgage interest money or loan. Do you know which one it is, Mike, when you want to buy a house? Loan. Loan. The fourth one. Alright. I'm going to tell you that's not correct. It it is it is okay and it does mean you owe money, but there's a better word for when you're buying a house. Mortgage. Mortgage. Yeah, that, this one, mortgage. So yeah. mortgage is a loan for a house. So if somebody says, I have a mortgage, it means it's on a house only. It's not on something else, it's a house. So it's usually a loan for a house. So loan is correct, but mortgage is better. Interest and money are wrong. Um, Mike, what's interest? If you're paying interest, what does that mean? Um, that means you uh, you put money inside the bank and you can get uh, some interest after like years or yeah, that's right. So if you have a hundred dollars and they're paying you ten percent interest, that means you get ten dollars. It also works the other way. If you borrow one hundred dollars, the bank charges you interest. So it can go either way. Okay, thank you, Mike. Dave. Yes. Next one. Uh, David, he has a gross salary of £2,000 a month, but after something, he only takes home 1400 a month. Now, do you know what this means, gross salary? Do you know this word gross? Sort of. Well, before we go that, do you know do you know the answer? But after something, tax allowance, tax exile, income tax or tax free. 
Yeah, um, correct. After income, what's income tax? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. All right, let's say uh, what, uh, Dave, when you get a job, what job do you want? Engineer. All right, you're going to be an engineer. Uh, let's say that you earn a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, will you get exactly one hundred thousand dollars a year? No. You have to pay the Why not? That's right. That's called income tax. So income tax is the, if you like, the government tax pay, uh, paid on your income. Okay? Okay. That's what, uh, well, that's what I call income tax. So I, in Australia, I have to pay, I think it's 32% income tax per year. So if I earn a hundred thousand, how much income? How much income tax am I paying, Dave? If I earn a hundred thousand, thirty-two thousand. That's right. So now, so this is income tax. Now he gets a gross salary of two thousand a month. Um, gross means total before tax so a gross salary is your salary before income tax after you pay income tax it's called a net salary okay so gross salary is before income tax net salary is after income tax okay that's the difference thank you right Rita how are you today Hello. How's it going? Hello, Rita. Rita, she worked really hard this year, so she was given a 10% pay decrease inflation extra or increase. So she's worked really hard, so she's got which one? Decrease inflation, extra increase. Increase. That's right, increase. Sorry, I think you said that. Increase. Now, what is inflation? Yes. That's right. So the economy is not very good and the cost of living increases. So in Australia we have um we have a strong economy, so our inflation is uh, I think it's about three percent three to four percent per year, which is not too bad. What is it in Taiwan? How much is it in Taiwan, do you know? No, I don't know. No, it's probably similar because your economy, I believe you're, you've got a strong economy as well. Okay, now, today we are doing Confucian Education Ideals. It's written by a guy called Herbert Hanreich and he's an assistant professor at Aishu University in Greater Kaohsiung. Now, RIT. Um, Sean, do you know what RIP means? Mm -hmm. 
morning sir and I don't know what to buy. All right. If would you, would you like would you like RIP next to your name? Um, no thanks. Why not? I mean you type and it's not good. That means it means you're dead. Okay? So when we say RIP, it means somebody is dead and we hope they uh, rest in peace in heaven is the usual. So they rest in peace, that means that they had a good life and now they're happy. So while you're alive, most people don't want RIP. Now, um, Sean, who was Confucius? Confucius is the first one who educated people. Yes. Um, is he still respected in Taiwan? I think so. Yeah. Well, we're told that Confucius is a a Chinese philosopher. Philosopher. And his Confucian principles Principles is the same as ideals, um, or if you like, morals. They are um, ideals you live your life by. So it might be no, no stealing, uh, respect for teachers and parents, and so on. Okay, so they're they're um, they're ideals. Now this particular reading is talking about about Confucian education ideal. It's actually taken from the Taiwan uh, Times News. So this is where I got this from. It was published last week, I think. So it says every year Chinese cultures. So that includes Taiwan, it's using plural, celebrate the 28th of November as Teacher's Day, September, sorry, in honor of Confucius, because that was his birthday. Confucian ideals remain, as it has been put in the famous encyclopedia, the substance of learning, the source of values, and the social codes of the Chinese. His name stands for a whole culture. Now, um... Martin. Yes. Why is Teachers' Day uh, on the uh, on the twenty eighth of September? It's Confucius' birthday. That's correct. Good. Thank now, Martin, what does this mean? His name stands for a whole culture. His is referring to Confucius. But what does it mean? His name stands for a whole culture. Why? Confucius is the Chinese culture, uh, is the symbolization of the Chinese culture. That's right. So they, they respect him, and they call him the substance of learning. So he gives, you, he gives Chinese cultures learning, he gives them values, and he gives them a social code. Now what is a social code, Martin? I don't know. All right. What does social mean? A lot of people. Yeah. All right. Now, when a lot of people live together, uh, can they all do what they want? So when a lot of people live together, can they all do exactly what they want? No. 
good. That's the social code. So the social code means, uh, well, give me, can you kill people? No. That, that's the social code, no killing. Uh, no, um, you respect your teachers, you respect your parents, and so on. Okay? So that's the social it means code. Real. So, say again? Yeah, that's right, Martin. It's like the rules, if you like, it's the rules of society. It's the rules we live by. So, no stealing, no killing, no raping, uh, no, um, no violence, and so on. You, go, you do your job, you go home, you get married, you have children, that's the social code, the rules we live by. And that, so Confucius was very important. Now it says Taiwan also celebrates Teacher's Day. Um, Amy, is Teacher's Day a national holiday in Taiwan? Uh, no, it's not a holiday. So it's just a day, okay. So a variety yeah. of activities take place in most of the Confucian temples. Now, they called him the first and model teacher. He's considered the spiritual founding father of the Chinese cultural edifice. Edifice here means society. So, society, uh, edifice is like an institution. Um, and it, so, it's edifice here is referring to society. It's not a word we use much. And it serves as a symbol of what Confucian cultures are proud of, good and lifelong education. So one of the main things with which Confucius is associated is a good and good education. This is important not only as a preparation for the workforce, but as an ideal way to cultivate morality. Amy, what's morality? Yeah. yeah. So, are you a good moral girl? I'm a moral girl. Lord here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> now, Amy, it says um, we're talking about education here, and yes. it says this. So this is referring to education. So this is what we call a ref for a referent word. It's referring to education, and it says education is important not only as a preparation for the workforce but also as an ideal way to cultivate morality. So, education teaches your morality, okay. Why is education preparation for the workforce, Amy? You can learn skills. That's right, exactly. You can learn skills. So, it teaches you literacy. It teaches you rules. All right, so education, it teaches you literacy, it teaches you rules, and it teaches you skills. Amy, what's literacy? Um, to write and to read. And That's right. And today, also, um, I'm going to say computer literacy. So it teaches you computer skills. These are very important. So, for example, today you're using an Apple iMac to talk to me across about 5,000 kilometers of sea. So that's another skill that you've learned, and that may be useful to you in the future. Perhaps you might um, have a job where you have to use uh, video conferencing or something. 
All right, now it says, education is an essential ingredient in Chinese culture. Not just Chinese, but Taiwanese as well here. Throughout most of China's long history, education has been a prerequisite for career advancement within imperial administration. Imperial means uh, royal or uh, to, do with, um, to do with emperor. So when there was a Chinese emperor, that was imperial administration. Until not long ago, careers in European administration depended on one's affiliation to certain social classes. Affiliation means you belong. So if you are middle class, that means that your affiliation is to the middle class. So they were born into rather than on education. Um, so this is saying that uh, education is very important. So for example in China, a prerequisite. Um, who's next there? Bob. Hello. Yeah? What's a prerequisite? What does that word mean? You have to do something as well. Yeah. So it's something you must have before you can do something. So, uh, Bob, um, uh, what can I say? Before <laughs> you do this class, what are prereq? What skills are prerequisite? So you're doing a class now with me. What skills must you have before you can do it? There's two things I can think of. Um, I have basic English communication. Yes, communication skills, and also English skills. So it's already it's all very well having communication. You've got to speak a little bit of English because I can't speak Mandarin. So you've got to be able to use a computer and English. They're prerequisite skills. So it's saying here that for um, career advancement in inside China, you had to belong to a particular social class and you were born into it. So you couldn't get in. So um, Bob, what, what's your social class? Let's say you're middle. Okay. Uh, lower means generally, um, not always, but it's working class. Education in working class is often not not great. So so. Um, money for low, for working class is not high. So middle class is what most people are, and that means they have reasonable education and money, education and wages. Now you're in this class, and that means that your parents have a little bit of money to send you to, to, to university, and you know, you've you've got a reasonable lifestyle. So, if you were living 2,000 years ago, do you think you would have been, do you think you would have been um, an administrator? No. <laughs> what do you think you would have been? A peasant? <laughs> All right, let's say you'd have been 
a little bit higher, but it's hard to know. What's the peasant? Yeah, <laughs> careful. Uh, some farmers are, so it's a lower class worker who uh, doesn't have much money or land. Um, probably you don't have many now in Taiwan. There are still some in China, I believe. Now, a complex testing system has been gradually devised. So we're talking again about education. Obliging. Obliging means forcing. So if you're obliged to do something, you're forced to do it. Obliging candidates to pass scores of exams. Um, most of the tests were unrelated to the needs of the professional world, but in order to advance, these exams had to be passed. Were these exams relevant to work? Um, who is next? Leonard Lynn. Hi, sir. Hello, Leonard. Leonard, um, question. We're talking about exams, a complex testing system. Were these exams relevant to work or not? A question here I've written, were these exams, we're talking about these exams, were they relevant to work or not relevant to the work that people did? Mm. Not relevant to work. Right, so why did they have to be passed? So why did they have to pass the exam? Because they are obligated to test. Yeah, but why? That's the basic. In, in order to advance. Right, what does that mean, in order to advance? In order to be a professional. Good. So in order to um, progress to a good job. So here, advance means to go, you know, you have to pass your exams before you can get a good professional job. Now it said this situation, so it's referring back to this, this situation, so passing exams which probably aren't that relevant has not changed in Taiwan. So it's comparing this system to Taiwanese education. There's a growing discrepancy. Discrepancy, I'm going to ask uh, Tony, I'm going to ask you what discrepancy means in a minute. So it says this, there is a growing discrepancy between academic education and professional requirements, which is something to do with the adoption of Confucian thought. And then we're going on in a minute to talk about five factors that explain the situation. Tony, what is discrepancy? Means different. Yes. So there's a growing, if you like, um, this is one thing, that's another. So discrepancy is the distance between them, how similar they are. So discrimination means they're not very Sorry, discrepancy means they're not very similar. So now, Tony, what what does this mean? There's a growing discrepancy between academic education and professional requirements. What, what's he talking about?
So Tony, that's my answer. Now you tell me what I mean by my answer. A big gap. All right, uh, Tony. What course are you doing at university? So, what what's your main subject? What? M I S. All right. Will you learn all the skills you need at university? All right, Tony, you're getting an academic education right now. Now, when you become, when you get a professional job, do you think, do you think these, do you think your academic education will give you all the skills you need in your job? Or if I tell you no, where will you learn your work skills, Tony? I don't know. I am a rookie. All right, but if you if not in university, where will you learn work skills? At work. That's right. So you have to get a job to learn work skills. So it's saying that it's saying that in Taiwan, an academic education does not give you work skills, professional requirements, and it's saying it's because of Confucius. So Confucius values education, but. Confucian education may not be work education. Now they say this is the five reasons. First, so these are the reasons why Confucian education may not be good for work. Scores of freshman students, that's you, Tony, you're a freshman, are ushered. Ushered means um, actually will. I'm going to ask you what ushered means in a minute. So ushered into the classrooms of many local college and university departments, even though they do not really want to be there. They often take a subject because they were instructed to by their family. The student, bound by filial piety. I'm also going to ask you what that means, Will. So you've got two words so far, ushered and filial piety. I don't know if that's very fair, actually. Um, I'm going to tell you. I'll tell you. All right. Well, just worry about ushered. I'll tell you what filial piety means in a minute. Um, humbly gives in. It's not surprising that students do not succeed in the job market and later switch careers when they did not choose their profession. Right. Will. What's ushered? If we usher you into a classroom, what does that mean? It means introduce into a classroom. Sort of. Yep. Uh, usher the noun means it's somebody who takes you or shows you to your seat in a concert or a restaurant or a cinema. So ushered means that, um, if you like here, you're pushed into. You don't really want to go, but you have no choice. 
Now, uh, Will, why haven't they got a choice? Why, why do these students, why do they do the subject if they don't want to do it? All right. The the stu they're talking about students here, and they're saying students are forced into the classroom to do a subject they don't want want to do. So they they do not really want to be there. So they take a subject. Why do they take the subject if they don't really want to? What is making them take the subject? Because. Why are they studying they, something they don't want to do? What does this mean? Because they were instructed to by their family. Will, do you respect your parents? Right, do you respect your, right, you respect your parents' wishes? Why? Um, because because they're your parents. Now, Will, yes. if if your parents wanted you to be a policeman, would you become a policeman? Uh, if a policeman's salary is higher than <laughs> the current job, and I do All right. Well, this is, this is here saying students, the family say, their father, their mother say, I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be a lawyer. I want you to do this. So the student, filial piety means respect for parents. The student gives in. Now that's the reason why many students don't succeed in the job market. They're doing something they don't really want to because their parents made them do it. So they don't succeed, they don't like the job, they haven't got the skills, so they later switch careers when they did not choose their profession. So if you don't choose it, you won't do it. You have to be motivated to do something. Uh, Will, what does motivated mean? Uh, it has uh, the intention to study. Yeah. yeah. What motivates you? What do you find good? Money. <laughs> Fair enough. Nothing like money to motivate, I agree with you. So, you know, and you said that before, you said if a policeman's salary was very good, you'd be a policeman. Um, would you like to be a, um, a ballet dancer? Um, to be what? Do you know what a ballet dancer is? What's ballet? Oh. No, I don't want to be a... Uh, no, well, I don't blame you either. Mm -hmm. Most males don't like to be a ballet dancer. Um, that's a ballet dancer. So... Would this be Will?
So you've got to be you've got to be very fit. You've got to be able to dance, and you've got to want to do it. Otherwise, you won't do it. So anyway, to get back to this, sorry. So it's saying a lot of people are forced into jobs they don't want. Second, exam results restrict a student's options. So if you don't get good exam results, you can't do what you want. It forces them to choose subjects in which they have no interest. These subjects are accordingly below par. Their achievements are below par. That means they're not good. If you're below par, that means your achievements are not very good. The result of this mis mismatch, that means there's no, one doesn't match the other. The, the result of this mismatch is that students and their study after graduation, many don't continue. They don't like the subject. They seek work in different fields. So really, these things are saying more or less the same thing. So the family want you to do a particular career so you do it but you don't like it so your career is not what you want um, where's he gone? Will's gone um, James Hi teacher are you doing a career you want are you studying for a career you want? Not exactly. <laughs> what would you What would you like to do if you had a choice? What would you like to do? Um, I haven't think of it um, yet, actually. Okay. What are, What are you studying? Information management. Okay. Do you think that's a good career? I mean, putting aside what whether you, do you think information management is likely to be a successful career for you? I don't think so, because my Why program is not good. Hmm. Who chose your program? Your parents? Um, yes. Hmm. So, this is you then. So, you're doing something you don't really want to do, and perhaps your subject are something you don't like. So you might, your work, your final work may be different to what you want to do in the future. Right? But still, you're, it's a start. Okay. Now it says investment in higher education in both cases. So here where we're talking about the family and the subjects is a waste of time, money, and human resources. It's all a waste of time. Um, many students who would be successful if they were allowed to study their interests, do not get the chance because they can't pass entrance exams. So, you know, you may want to do something, but if you can't pass the exam, you can't do it. Um, James, what are human resources in a workforce? What are human resources? The deal people can do. Yep. Are you a human resource? Yes. Are you a good one? Um, not, n I'm not a good one. <laughs> mm, not, not yet. You might be in the future. So a human yeah. resource is just a worker. It's a worker with skills. So if you're a human resource, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm a good human resource for what I do, which is teach. If I worked um, as an electrician, I would be absolutely useless because I know nothing about being an electrician. Okay. Now, a third factor, so this is again talking about job skills, is that teaching from kindergarten to graduate is simply taken from textbooks rather than cutting edge knowledge to be found in top journals. So, in other words, they're doing old, non-relevant materials are being taught in class. In uh, I'll call them Asian classrooms. Only a few teachers connect teaching with current research. So it's saying that a lot of teachers, they don't bother, they just have a textbook 
and it might be, I don't know, 20 years old and not very relevant. They still use it. Why? Because they've been told to. Pure textbook teaching, which, now this, which seems to be the prevailing, that's the main teaching method in this nation, this nation refers to Taiwan, remember, was inherited from the distant past. It's a perfect study killer. It focuses on memorization, not generating new content. Cindy. Hello, teacher. Hello. Cindy, um, do you understand what this paragraph is saying? It's talking about teaching from textbooks only. Do you, do you understand that, you know, in, in the past, at school, you did memorization and you learned from a textbook. Is that true? So, Cindy, did you get a good education at school? Right. Are you getting a good education now at university? Um, no. <laughs> Why not? So, Cindy, why, why are you not happy with your education? What would you like to see change? is a little hard to learn. Mm. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop asking, Cindy. <laughs> now, anyway, knowledge changes quickly. So, studying the reasons for change can be fascinating because it gives you an idea of what knowledge, rational argument, really means. Now, a sound education must include the student interest the student ability, so you gain knowledge from outside sources by yourself. And this helps reduce this gap between theory and application. Theory is what you do in uni. Application is what you need in your job, job skills. Now, it's usually somewhere in the middle. You know, so most courses teach you something, but they don't really teach you everything you need to know in university. Um, in the West, it, when we have Australia, we have many international students. And they're studying uh, in, <laughs> all right. We're studying in uni in Australia. Uh, they usually do courses like um, international economics um, and business. Some do nursing because it allows them to stay in Australia. Some do medicine, but they've got to be very rich because it's, uh, it's around $240,000 dollars Australian to do medicine over three years, so it's not cheap. But we, but often it is said, uh, well, lecturers in Australia, they say um, Asian students are not used to critical thinking. and providing their opinions. I'm typing this because I'm going to ask you a question in a minute.
All right. So in Australia, Asian students are not used to critical thinking and providing their opinions. It's not true of all, but it is true of a lot. Now, where's that Cindy one? Uh, just a minute, Cindy. Um, <laughs> I can't. Can I? All right. Um, if you look at the list, there's a Cindy between James and Carlos. So Cindy between James and Carlos. Can I speak to you? Yes, you can. All right, Cindy. What do you think of this statement I've just made? That Asian students are not used to critical thinking and providing their opinions. Do you think that's true? All right. Um, are you giving your opinion very well now, Cindy? <laughs> so, Cindy, are you giving? Are, are you? Do you like giving your opinion? Yeah. Right. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. That exactly that. Sometimes. Not always, sometimes. Now, if you come to Australia, the way you do, the way you answer essays and assignments is you have to give, you have to think about it, you have to give your opinion. We ask you to do research. We ask you to do, we ask you to do presentations. We ask you to think. Now, it is said by many people in Australia that Asian students find it difficult. Um, to um, to answer assignments where they have to think or where they have to um, provide opinions. Do you think that's true? In other words, they have to, they have to think their own. Opinions. They, they're not. You can't get it from a book. You have to think. Do you think that's true, Cindy? Yes. Why? So why do you think it is that? Teacher, can you repeat yeah, again? So my question's here. Why is it harder for Asian students to give opinions than Australian students, do you think? Um, uh, because we are, uh, Asian students are less, less thinking. That's right. Somebody said Asian students are very quiet and good listeners. So what about you, Cindy? Are you a very quiet girl and a good listener? Yes. Good. All right. I won't ask you to give any more opinions. Don't worry. All right. Now, to go on to the last page now, we'll have a break after this last page. <laughs> she eats a lot. That's interesting. Now, so the fourth thing, recently established teacher evaluation mechanism at university. So, Professor Pearl was talking about evaluation a minute ago. So, this is from you. You give evaluations at the end of each course. They put teachers under pressure. They, this often means keeping students happy instead of challenging them, has become the teacher's main aim, main priority. So, in other words, it's saying that the teacher has to keep the students happy. So instead of challenging you with something you don't really want to do, we just give you things that you find easy. 
Now, in return, students want to please the teacher. So they reward them with high grades. They give them a good evaluation score, a despicable game too often played in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, it's accusing teachers of giving you stuff that keeps you happy, easy, easy exams, for example. And in return, the students reward the teachers by giving them good evaluations. University policies try to elicit excellent teachers. All they do is encourage corruption. Um, Carlos. Carlos Pili. Yes, sir. Carlos, where are you from? What country uh, were you I'm born from in? The Philippines. Okay, I'm from the so that, Philippines. that accounts. Yeah. So, do you speak Spanish or of Tagalog? Excuse me, sir. Do you speak any Spanish or just Tagalog? Just Tagalog, sir. Okay. Now, because Carlos is a uh, well, you remember from last week, Carlos. <laughs> now, Carlos, do you think um, what is corruption? Corruption means uh, there's something wrong with the environment. Yeah, there's something wrong with the system. Yes. Yeah. So it does something illegal for gain. So is is there corruption in the Philippines? Yes, I think so. Mm. Do you think there's corruption in Taiwan? Careful. Who knows? So, the corruption here, they're saying that it's not really corruption. Corruption as we understand it, you end up in jail. So, but they're saying that teachers give students easy stuff, and so the students give teachers good evaluations. That's what it's saying. Whether that's true, I'm not sure, but that's what the article says. Fifth, local businessmen. Oh, Tagalog. What's Tagalog, Carlos? Tagalog is the Philippine Filipino language. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Or as well, it's a national language of the Philippines. A lot of the Philippines speak English as well but Tagalog is the native language, the first language of the Philippines. All right, you have to say something in Tagalog. <laughs> say. <laughs> say Pearl is a fantastic teacher in Tagalog. Uh, Kamusta ka? I love you. Mahal kita. What else do you guys want to say? Oh, you are very beautiful. Maganda ka. Evie, how about hello? Kamusta? Okay, that's very beautiful. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. <laughs> Alright, we're nearly finished. Now, the fifth factor Local businesses are creating jobs that make few intellectual demands, but you still need a university diploma. So they're saying, um, if a job makes few intellectual demands, Joanne? Yes? Do you, what, what does this mean, a job with few intellectual demands? Is that a boring job or an exciting job? Yeah, very boring. Give it. Give me an example of a boring job. So give me an example that would bore you. Typing work. Would you like to work at McDonald's? Mm, not too. Why not? I 
don't like it. You could be a manager, get free hamburgers and get fat. I can run. No. Well, yeah, McDonald's can make intellectual demands, actually. You have to be literate and numerate. What does numerate mean? So if you're numerate, Joanne, what does that mean? All right, Joanne. What 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 is your prefer what is your preferred future job? What would you like to do? I'm not saying what you're studying for. I'm saying what would you like to do? Engineering. You'd like to be an engineer. What sort? Okay, computer engineer. That's an interesting option. Okay, are you studying? Are you studying IT, Joanne? Yes. Good. So you're on your way. Now, so <laughs> a computer engineer will make intellectual demands, and it will be a university degree diploma, which is relevant. So this is not true for you. However, an increasing number of young people are unsuited for academic tasks and forced into colleges and universities. Now, this here, it says, there seems to be an infinite trust in a piece of paper with an official stamp, but not in the students. Coco? Hello, teacher. Hello, Coco. Coco, um, piece of paper. What's that referring to? There's another phrase in here that piece of paper is referring to. What is it? So, what does pe what does piece of paper refer to? <laughs> it's it's in this paragraph here. So somewhere in there, in this paragraph, there's another phrase which means the same as a piece of paper. It's a special piece of paper. University diploma. Right. Coco, do you think having a university diploma is important? Yes. Right. Do you think do you think having a university diploma d does that mean that you will be a good worker? Not really. Why? Your opinion. That's right. A university diploma might not give you the abilities to do the job. You might not have the skills to do the job. So many students who perform, who perform poorly in academic circles, that means who don't do well in uni, would be a lot more successful in practical skills. So rather than rather than doing um, rather than doing teaching, you might be better doing something like being an electrician or a plumber or a builder. Now t I don't know about Taiwan, but I tell you, electricians, plumbers, and builders get more money. than uh, a lot of academics. If you are 
if you are an engineer or a doctor or a, um, a skilled computer professional, you can get a lot of money if you've done if you enjoy it. But a lot of people, electricians, plumbers and builders, they don't they have a they have what we call in Australia a vocational qualification. They learn they don't go to university, they go to what we call TAFE colleges. And TAFE colleges in Australia are uh, technical um, and further education. And that is a clever way of saying that they may start at TAFE, some go on to university when they've done their vocational training, but um, a lot go straight to university and they may, they may miss out. So the opinion of this writer is that Taiwan, the nation's education system, is in a poor state. He doesn't think the education system is, in, is good in Taiwan. He says it's because local education ideals are based on traditional backward-looking culture, or they've been infiltrated by business traits which are killing ideals. So he's saying that education in Taiwan is not good, and he should, said you shouldn't celebrate Teacher's Day, but an education system that's rest in peace is dead. Lulu. Hello. Okay. Do you agree? Do you agree with this opinion? Do you think the education system in Taiwan is no good? Maybe. So what do you think of the education you got in Taiwan at school? So, Lulu, did, did you learn a lot at school? You did? Good. Were, were you, are you happy with your schooling? Some of it. Some of it. Okay. What was no good about it? What didn't you like at school? Too conservative. Okay. That's sort of what they're saying in this article. So you would have liked a more we call um okay. Did you go to a single a single sex school or mixed? So were there girls and boys or just girls? Mixed. Mixed. Was that good? Better than single sex? Uh, I think so. Why? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Amy said more like a society, uh, sort of. In other words, um, you learn what boys and girls are like. You learn the relationships a little better. But sometimes single-sex schools 
um, are better. It depends on what you're going to do. Anyway, let's have a break. Come back in about 10 minutes, Bo. 10, 15 minutes.